Well, good morning or good afternoon or evening, wherever you are. My name is Steve Ferguson, and we're pleased to welcome you to the Washington Labs Academy webinar series. We hope you'll find the next hour or so useful and informative. We developed our webinar series to deal with issues that are faced on a day-to-day -day basis, the technical and administrative, that our customers face. We recognize that engineering challenges can be complex, and we're always looking for ways to support the technology industry. Before we begin, I hope that everyone can see the title slide on your computer. This presentation is part of our series presented for this calendar year, and this particular session is one of the eight parts for commercial wireless compliance. Uh, before we begin, I want to do a few housekeeping details. We muted everyone's microphone to keep the meeting quality as high as possible. The recording of this event is underway, and all registered attendees will receive a link to the recording valid for 30 days and a copy of the presentation. A training certificate is sent to all people attending the live event. You may prefer a full screen view. Just select full screen and escape from the menu and, and full screen from the menu panel and escape will allow you to return to the normal view. <clears throat> we encourage questions during the event. Please submit your question using the chat or Q&A icon at the top or side of your screen and type your questions to the host. We will go through the questions at the end of the presentation and not interrupt the presenter during the event. We'd like to hear from you. If I can get my slide to work, we'd like to hear from you. You can contact Washington Laboratories through the Academy at WLL or the speaker directly, Mike Darby, Michael D at acbcert.com. Uh, we estimate that the bulk of the presentation will take about one hour and we'll allow some time for questions at the end. I would now like to introduce our speaker, <clears throat> Michael Darby is the Senior Review Engineer and Director at American Certification Body in Europe. He has been with ACB since November 2007. Michael is a TCB for the FCC, an FCB for Industry Canada, now I said, and a notified body for the RNTTE, EMC, and Radio Equipment Directives. Michael is an active member of the Red CA and TCB Council, acting as the liaison between the two organizations. He is also the chairman of the TCB Council Board of Directors. He is secretary of the EMC Test Laboratory Association, responsible for education on testing methods and standards development. Michael's past experience includes product development, testing and certification for test laboratories and manufacturers. Michael provides worldwide services to ACB's global customers from his office in the Hampshire area of the UK. Michael, welcome. I'd like to now turn the presentation over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Steve. And uh, thank you for the uh, kind introduction there. And uh, yeah, uh, good morning to you and uh, welcome. Your audio, to your audio is good and you have control of the ball. All right. Thank you very much. So let me uh, select my presentation here. So yeah, it's, um, Good morning to uh, those in the USA, uh, afternoon to those with me here in Europe, and uh, good night uh, to anybody further east. So as Steve said there, I am Michael Darby uh, from ACB, and uh, I want to talk to you today about the Radio Equipment Directive. I'm not going to spend too long on introductions because, uh, well, Steve already did a fantastic job, but also because you didn't really come here to hear about me. But American Certification Body, if you didn't know, is a, a notified body, uh, a notified body to the RNTTE directive for the next seven weeks. Uh, and then we are a radio, notified body to the Radio Equipment Directive and the EMC Directive. And we're a certification body for the USA, Canada, Japan, and Hong Kong. We also offer compliance management and planning, uh, product compliance uh, help, test planning, Identification of essential test suites was uh, a name used under the RNTT directive, um, not under the red, but uh, you know the uh, the process is still there. International approvals, often known as global market access, and of course training courses. Actually, recently we've been spending a lot of time doing gap analysis reports for people who have a an RNTTE compliant product, and they need to know exactly what they have to do with that product 
to upgrade it to the red. We have offices all around the world. Uh, as the company name suggests, we started in the USA. We're a global company now, and I'm in our England office in Winchester in Hampshire. And my own personal background, I started work 30 years ago um, for a manufacturer. I began EMC testing in the late 1980s on uh, computer products. I then worked for a, 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 an independent EMC and radio test lab for many years in the USA and Europe. And I've been uh, an attendee at Etsy, writing Etsy standards in the past. Now I'm at ACB. And my business card says director, but really uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm an engineer and I, I perform the technical reviews. So if you were to submit a notified body or certification body product to us, um, it's quite possible that I could be your reviewer. Uh, as Steve said, I am the chairman of the TCB Council. I get involved with the RED Compliance Association and I write several of their technical guidance notes. I'm the liaison between the two groups, the secretary of the EMC TLA. Okay, so let's get onto the presentation. Well, I don't really need to talk about the red, do I? I think we're already experts. Um, we've, uh, we've all been here before. It's an old document. Um, we've all been using it for a long time. All of our products are compliant with the red. Uh, there's nothing that we don't know about it. And uh, so we can close the, close the presentation now, surely. Uh, well, sadly, it's not that simple. Um, uh, there are still a lot of questions. I, I personally receive uh, many, many emails per day on the red. And that's not surprising. I don't think you should feel bad about that. Uh, for a start, it's, um, it's, it's pretty simple, but uh, there are some changes, and some of the changes are still being clarified. Uh, there's a, a red guide that isn't actually finally published yet. There's uh, test standards which aren't completed yet. So don't feel bad about the fact that we are seven weeks away and you still have questions. So now let's have a little look at these questions. Just a quick uh, overview of the webinar today. I'm going to remind us again about the timeline. Um, it, it should be clear to everybody, but I would say I get asked the question at least once per day on the, uh, the timeline aspect, and specifically with regard to which products must comply with the red. Is it my old products, my current products, or how about my new products only? Really, I've been speaking about the red for a couple of years, probably, and uh, in the last six months especially, I've been given a few webinars and um, seminars. And so really, this webinar now is based on a frequently asked questions kind of idea. We're going to focus on the, the most common differences between the RNTTE directive and the RED. So this webinar is focused for people who haven't uh, really heard this before. But each time I speak, there's new little updates. So if you've been to one of these webinars before, um, there will be always little updates. Um, and uh, then we'll talk a bit about the latest development of the guide and the situation with the standards. And then a, finally, a practical approach and some of the documentation that, as a manufacturer, you might need to provide. Hopefully, this will also be useful for any test labs in attendance and other notified bodies, of course. OK, so if you are supplying a radio product to the EU, when I say EU, I don't mean the European continent. I mean the European member, EU member states, including the EEA and the EFTA. If you make a radio product or continue to sell a radio product or incorporate a radio module into your typically non-radio product, then this is for you because you are placing a radio onto the market in the EU. This presentation does assume some prior knowledge of the RNTT directive, but uh, you don't have to be an expert. OK, so let's have a little look at the RED. Um, the RED uh, was written many years ago. In fact, uh, it started in 2007, the development of it. Uh, and it replaces the RNTT directive. In fact, legally, it replaced the RNTT directive uh, in the, on the 13th of June 2016. And that was the first date at which you could start using the RED. But, the, um, but it included a one-year transition period whereby you could continue to use old legislation for the first year of the RED. And that effectively meant that you could continue to use the RNTT directive until, at latest, the 12th of June 2017. 
Now, you may have noticed that all of the uh, EU directives had a few little changes and updates in the last few years. The term used was that the directive was recast. Uh, and you would have seen that if you deal with the EMC directive and the, the low voltage directive. And typically, it was to align it with a, a document, the NLF, New Legislative Framework. And really, this was a, an alignment of terminology and uh, you know, making sure that all of the directives say similar things and have similar terms, but also to make sure that each of the EU member states are approaching the compliance and surveillance in a, in a consistent way. But um, uh, a lot of directives were just updated for these admin changes. But from the radio equipment directive transition from the RNTT directive, it was more than just an alignment with the, red, uh, with the NLF. Excuse me. Uh, it was also some technical changes. Uh, oh, and a quick comment again with regard to the timeline of this webinar. I will try to finish uh, in less than an hour, uh, purely because I suspect we might have questions. Okay, um, so let's look at the RE Directive, um, published on the 22nd of May 2014 um, and came into force on the 13th of June 2016. The number of the directive is 201453EU um, and it gets known as the RED. Now the D of RED stands for directive, so you don't need to say the RED directive. Not that it's a pet hate, but I just thought I'd point it out. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the, let's start with some similarities between the RNTT directive and the radio equipment directive. Well, firstly, safety, EMC and radio are all covered within the directive. So it's not just about the radio part. You wouldn't, for example, apply the radio equipment directive and the EMC directive and the low voltage directive because EMC and safety are involved or included in the RED just as they were in the RNTTE and therefore the EMC directive and the low voltage directive do not apply to any product um, with a radio in it because EMC and safety are covered in the radio directive. It's still a declaration of conformity style directive. Uh, there was a call actually for it to become a certification style directive, uh, but uh, that call was rejected. And so it's still a declaration of conformity on the end product by the manufacturer of that end product. Uh, there's the same compliance approaches that you would see under the RNTT directive. So you can either fully test to harmonize standards which have been listed on the official journal and sign your own uh, DOC without the use of a notified body. Or you can apply standards or draft standards or non-harmonized standards or some other kind of justification assessment and go through a notified body. Or you can set up a full quality assurance contract um, and review approach with the notified body. But that's actually a very rare, that last one. Not very many companies do that. But some differences do exist between the RNTTE and the RED. So let's look at those today. OK, so prior to the 13th of June 2016, all radio products placed on the market were assessed under the RNTTE directive. Uh, that included any typically non-radio products, by the way, which contain a permanently fitted radio module. So if you've got a laptop with Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, that would have been an RNTT directive device. Same if you had a, a washing machine or a refrigerator with a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi module installed, that would have been an RNTT device. The RED has been in use since the 13th of June 2016. Right now, whilst we're still in the transition period, you could use either the RNTT directive or the RED. Most people are by now transitioning to the red, and we've been seeing, uh, we've been seeing as a notified body, we've been seeing applications for notified body certificate since I'd say about January time, and, and that's quite consistent with the conversations we've had with other notified bodies, um, whereby the rate of uh, notified body certificate applications has, has pretty much started at the beginning of 2017 and slowly increased. By the 13th of June 2017, any existing products still being placed on the market must meet the red. So hopefully people are transitioning now, uh, but certainly the 12th of June 2017 would be the last date you could put a red, uh, an RNTTE directive compliant product on the market. 
But what does that mean exactly? What is on the market? Well, for start, there is no need to recall existing units from the market. Certainly, if those products are in people's homes or in people's hands, they are on the market there. You do not need to recall them or retest them. Even if you have stopped selling that product, you don't need to reassess it just because you have products out there. They're on the market and they are out of your hands at that point. It applies to new units of existing models. They must comply with the red. So if you have a product line and you've been selling units of that product line or that model number, um, to the RNTT directive, and you wish to keep selling that product line and that existing model number after the 13th of June, then that product line and that model number will need to be reassessed and uh, a new declaration will need to be created for the red. We could probably talk for a whole hour on the topic of placed on the market and its nuances. Um, I, I don't really want to go into the details of, uh, you know, taking it out of your factory and placing it in your warehouse. Um, but uh, what I would say is go to Google or any other internet search engine and type in EU Blue Guide. Uh, and it will bring you up with the uh, 2016 version of the EU Blue Guide. And that's a, a broad horizontal document which gives advice on all of the um, CE marking directives. Uh, and there's a whole section there on placing on the market. And uh, you can uh, check that there and build your own interpretation based on that document. So any new product entering the market after the 13th of June must, of course, meet the red. Other directives? Well, as I mentioned before, um, the Radio Equipment Directive includes EMC and safety, um, just as with the RNTT Directive. So a device uh, which is within scope of the RED is not within scope of the EMC directive and low voltage directive, so no change there. Uh, I know I've mentioned that twice now, I think, but uh, again, I receive that question probably a, at least once a day. Okay, so you'll notice the name has changed. R and TTE has become RE, and the TT is missing. That's because telecommunications terminal equipment has been removed, or Basically, I mean hard-wired communication devices, wired telephones, fax machines, if those still exist. Uh, those have been removed from the radio directive, and instead they will be covered by the EMC directive and the low voltage directive. So the radio equipment directive now only applies to wireless or radio devices. The scope of the directive, the scope of the communication type, has been clarified. Not really changed as such, just clarified. The radio devices that are covered by the RED are radio communication and radio determination. And for determination, we think of things like radar, RFID, movement detection, velocity measurement, etc. Those are all in scope. The only things that would be out of scope would be something that uses RF purely for a function. A microwave oven, for example, would be a good example of something which is not included in the RED. If we talked about uh, something like a wireless charger, for example, if we had a completely dumb wireless charger which just simply sits and, and sends out an RF signal, that would come under the EMC directive and the low voltage directive. But if that same charger involves any form of handshake, uh, whether that's at a low frequency uh, kind of handshaking um, solution or maybe a Bluetooth uh, solution, uh, any kind of communication would turn it into a radio product, and then the red would apply to that. Receive-only radio equipment is still in scope, so that's not a change. Um, why would I mention this? Well, simply because it's one of those things that a lot of people don't understand. Uh, the RNTT directive and the radio equipment directive covers transmitters, receivers, and transceivers. Broadcast receivers are now in scope. That's not so much a change uh, in the scope of the RED, it's more of a, uh, uh, a reflection of the scope of the R and TTE directive. So receive only devices were in scope of the R and TTE directive, but sound and broadcast receivers were specifically excluded from the R and TTE directive, but they are not excluded from the RED. So if you make a television receiver or a AM or FM radio, such as you might get in a car, for example, or bedside radio, 
they will not be covered by the Ian Sheehan Low Voltage Directive anymore. They will now be covered by the red. The frequency range of the directive has changed. The RMTT directive was 9 kilohertz to 3,000 gigahertz, and that's not a typing error, by the way, that really is 3,000. Uh, the frequency range of the RE directive, or the RED, however, just is up to 3,000 gigahertz. There is no lower uh, frequency limit. So there are communication devices below 9 kilohertz, and here at ACB, we've actually been working on some products below 9 kilohertz uh, uh, for notified by the projects. Um, and those are now, they would have gone from the EMC and low voltage directive and now they will be red products. Etsy has been working on the standards below 9 kilohertz. I must say, they have uh, not been a great deal of interest for just generic short-range devices down there, but uh, for specific product types, there has been some interest. And of course, the European Communications Office, the ECO, uh, must now create spectrum allocation down there. Well, if you ever got bored enough to sit down for a few hours with a, a mug of tea and a, uh, figure out the safety implications of the RMTT directive, you might have finally concluded that animals were covered. Uh, but it wasn't very clear to anybody who didn't spend that time. And to clarify, the radio equipment directive does specify the protection of health and safety of persons and of domestic animals and the protection of property. So domestic animals are covered by uh, uh, the red, but also protection of property. You can't have a, something which is going to uh, be destroyed or cause damage due to a poor radio performance. Now here's one of the most significant changes. It's just a few small words, uh, but uh, it has great implications for us as an industry. The RNTT directive really talked about spectrum performance uh, and EMC and safety. And EMC and safety, of course, um, are mostly for protection of the user, um, whether that's protection of their health or whether it's a protection of their rights to own a good product. But the radio performance part has mostly been revolving around uh, protection of the spectrum. Um, but uh, just really with regard to interference in most cases. Whereas the radio equipment directive is looking forward to the future, a time of uh, the internet of things where we're all connected. I don't know, uh, the RNTT directive obviously was published in 1999, but written before that. Uh, so I don't know how many of us out there owned a mobile phone in, uh, before 1999. I don't know how many of you might have had a, uh, a fitness tracker watch or a, um, any other kind of wearable uh, technology. And certainly you probably didn't have too many thoughts about uh, driverless cars back in those days. But nowadays our offices, uh, our kitchens, our medical facilities, um, and even our bodies are covered in radio products. So we need to think ahead to this situation and we need to plan for an efficient use of spectrum. We could have radio products everywhere. Uh, and there's only a finite amount of radio spectrum with which to achieve that. So it's also there's a direct correlation really between receiver efficiency uh, and efficient, efficient use of spectrum. Because if you imagine a, a receiver which has, has good receiver performance, well, you could reuse that channel again uh, a long way uh, nearby. Similarly, if it has good uh, adjacent channel rejection, then you could uh, have another user using an adjacent channel right next door. But if the receiver is poor, then typically you're not going to be able to reuse that channel or even the adjacent channels. Instruction from the European Commission to Etsy to include test cases for spectrum sharing uh, and receiver performance. So Etsy has been working very hard cases for the modern state of the art into those Etsy standards. Uh, and as I said, this is a, a part of making the red a little more future prepared. There's a, um, a, a small change, I guess you could say, to the safety aspect, and that's the inclusion of the expression reasonably foreseen use. The RMTT directive uh, made it clear that a product must be compliant for its intended purpose but the Radio Equipment Directive includes reasonably foreseen use. Well, really this was added because all of the other safety-related directives uh, called for that. Um, but it's, uh, it does affect us a little bit. It's uh, an important reminder to think about how the product uh, will be used. 
Um, and that may change uh, as the state of the art changes and as we as manufacturers observe how people are using our products. Um, for example, I'm sure mobile phone manufacturers started off making a phone that someone would make a normal call held to their head. Um, and nowadays they see people walking around with them held to their hands, held to their bodies um, in all sorts of conditions and environments. So we have to see how products get used. The main focus of this is product safety. Um, and uh, some people may say that it's simply putting into text what people should have been doing anyway. There's greater responsibility within the supply chain under the red. Now, this is an important change from the RNTT directive to the red. And the history here is simply the fact that under the RNTT directive, uh, there was a lot of problems, a lot of cases of the market surveillance authority finding a product having a non-compliant product in their hand, hopefully having the declaration of conformity that accompanied it in their other hand, uh, or maybe uh, being able to find that de declaration of conformity on the internet for manufacturer. But finding it difficult to match the exact product in their hand to the exact issue of declaration of conformity, especially if the product has been, been sold for many years and the declaration of conformity may have been updated, how do they know which version of the DOC applies to the exact product they have in their hand? And how, how do they then contact the person or the company who's responsible for it? That's always been a big problem for market surveillance under the RNTT directive. And the RED hopes to fix a lot of that. The manufacturer is therefore responsible for the initial assessment and compliance of the device. And if any modification or rebranding of the product takes place, then the new company who rebrands that product becomes the manufacturer and therefore takes on legal responsibility. For example, they would need to create their own declaration of conformity. So the RED actually describes greater levels of responsibility and communication with all of the economic operators in the supply chain. And that means the manufacturer, uh, an importer if the manufacturer is outside the EU, uh, a distributor if one exists. So importers, for example, uh, are responsible for ensuring that they have imported a compliant device. And that might mean checking the paperwork of the product. Um, but if they have any doubts or concerns, they would be responsible for testing or assessing the product that they're importing because they, are, they can be held responsible if they import a non-compliant product. Importer must even go to the lengths of um, adding their information to the product packaging. Better contact information is required for everybody, uh, but also for the product. The product label or the product uh, enclosure must show identifying numbers and contact details to the responsible parties. For example, the, the name of the product would need to be on the device, um, but also the name and address of the manufacturer. If the product is particularly small and that's not possible, then you could put that name and address of the manufacturer on the, uh, the user manual. Certainly, you'd want the name of the manufacturer to be on the product, but the address could be on the user manual if the product is too small. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not the one to ask uh, is <laughs> what is too small or too large. Uh, that's really a manufacturer's decision, I would say. Traceability is very important. As I say, it was a big issue under the RNTT directive. Uh, registration, product registration, was an issue which got discussed uh, during the development of the RED. Uh, and um, it's not been included specifically for all devices, but it's certainly not been left out either. So registration applies to products uh, from the 12th of June 2018, uh, but only products which are included on a list um, of products that require such a registration. Right now, there are no products on that list. I guess you could uh, say it's a little like Santa's naughty list. So if in the first couple of years or first year or so of the uh, our radio equipment directive or at any time after that, particular types of products show consistent non-compliance, then they could find themselves on that naughty list requiring uh, equipment uh, or product registration. There is a, a slight change to the document you might receive if you go to a notified body. Under the RNTT directive, you would have received a notified body opinion. But under the RED, it's called a EU-type examination certificate. 
Now it's still a, a declaration of conformity style directive. Don't confuse this with certification. This isn't a type of approval certificate. It's simply a type examination certificate. And therefore, in, in that sense, it's really very similar to the old notified body opinion. And it allows the manufacturer to place the CE mark on their product if a non-harmonized radio standard is used. Using a notified body is mandatory if a, a radio product, the radio test standard is not listed on the RED official journal. So we use the word harmonized standard, and, and that's the common term to say harmonized standard. You have to be a little bit careful because any standard which has been written and published by Etsy or Senelec would be called harmonized by those organizations. It's only really acceptable uh, for compliance once it's been listed on the RED official journal. It doesn't just simply mean it has the word harmonized on the title. And if the standards you are using for radio performance is not listed on the official journal, then you must use a notified body. Now here's a change from the RNTTE directive. Use of a notified body is not mandatory when using non-harmonized EMC or safety test standards. So if you use non-harmonized standards, or indeed if you deviate from the EMC and safety standards, or perhaps you take EMC and safety standards from some other uh, source to show your EMC and safety uh, compliance, that does not mandate notified body certificate. That was actually the intention during the RNTTE days, but uh, through not much more than a typing error, really, that never uh, became the case. Okay, so just as a quick comment, if any of you are notified bodies or are thinking of being notified bodies, or perhaps wondering why the price has changed, uh, there's uh, quite a lot more work involved for a notified body under the red uh, compared to the RNTT directive. We need to keep internal reports and a great, uh, greater level of evidence of the compliance. And the background of that really is notified bodies issuing uh, notified body opinions without sufficient evidence of exactly why they, they did what they did. We must all report our certificates that we've issued to the EU via our designating authorities. And we must report any withdrawn or withheld or suspended or restricted certificates to other notified bodies. That won't be a public reporting, but if any notified body does not uh, fails to issue a certificate or refuses to issue a certificate or withdraws one, then we have to tell all the other notified bodies about it. Now, that doesn't mean if you submit a project to a notified body and they come back and give you a little list of things to fix, they're not going to immediately go and tell the other notified bodies. That's not the purpose of this. The purpose is for cases where a product is simply non-compliant with the directive and the notified body tells the manufacturer it's non-compliant and, and the manufacturer walks away. And then the notified body must tell all the other notified bodies that that took place. And that way, if the manufacturer goes to another notified body, then that other notified body already knows that the product is not acceptable. As uh, notified bodies, we must now get 17065 accreditation, although there are other accreditation routes such as 17020. We must demonstrate how we stay active and current with our training, such as attending meetings and uh, getting involved in standards, etc. So in general, the red is more lengthy and more expensive business for a notified body. Okay, so let's look at compliance to the red. Well. If you really step back and look at it from a very broad sense, the RED is very similar to the RNTT in approach. You're going to have your product, you're probably going to test it, you're going to stick a label on it, you're going to create a declaration of conformity, you're going to gather a load of technical documents or paperwork and start selling it. And from that regard, it's exactly the same. There's no change really in compliance approach. You haven't got a completely different process. So from that point of view, uh, it's very similar. As a manufacturer, the first thing I would recommend is to, to take a broad look at your portfolio of products and really carefully think, have any of your products changed directive scope? You might be looking at your RNTTE radio products and thinking to yourself, OK, I, I need to think about these with regard to the red now. But what about other products? If you have FM radio receivers or television receivers or anything that operates below 9 kilohertz, you might have just been applying the EMC directive to those in the past and 
you may now need to stop and think, OK, this is now a red product. If your product was already compliant to the RMTT directive, can you simply say that it now meets the red? Well, no, not very simply, not, certainly not without some sort of effort or consideration. And in most cases, some testing. But it's very difficult to think of a product which would not require any form of testing. Any product which will be or is still being placed on the market after the 13th of June must be reassessed to the latest requirements. I've written assessed because, of course, you can do whatever you like to assess it. But in most cases, in reality, that's going to mean testing. If you have those products on the market, as I mentioned before, if you stop selling the product or stop shipping new products before the 12th of June 2017, then you're not going to need to reassess them. If you take all the products on your uh, production line now and get them all out of the factory and out onto the market shelves before the 12th of June, then that's it. You could say you just decided not to proceed with the red with that product. But if you continue to supply new units uh, onto the market and carry on manufacturing after the 13th of June, products already compliant to the RNTTE directive using RNTTE's test standards cannot assume you meet the red based on those old tests. As I mentioned before, with this uh, efficient use of spectrum, in most cases there are new radio receiver test cases. There's actually also some cases of additional transmitter test cases, such as spectrum sharing, adaptivity, new duty cycle requirements, etc. So in many cases, the latest technical requirements for meeting the red are generally tougher than the old RNTTE requirements. Are there harmonized standards yet? Well, as most of you will probably know if you're in this industry for some time, harmonized standards, which have been listed on the official journal, are the most simple way to show compliance with a directive. If you test to harmonize standards, which are listed on the official journal, they provide you, the manufacturer, with presumption of conformity to the directive. But what does presumption of conformity mean? Well, I'll be honest, it's not a huge deal in, in most cases. From a legal point of view, my understanding is that if you have presumption of conformity, then you can relax and, and it's the requirement of some anybody else to prove to you that your product is non-compliant. As if you don't have presumption of conformity, uh, then if somebody uh, comes to you with some sort of situation, it would be more up to you as the manufacturer to prove why it does comply. But beyond that, there's not much to it. Standards are being written and added to the official journal regularly. Etsy contributors have been very busy. You have to remember that Etsy does not employ engineers as such. They uh, have uh, empty rooms full of people who would go there as, uh, as you and I, really. I used to do it quite a lot. Um, and uh, we would contribute to writing the standards. And when you see standards that are quite late, it either means that the contributors had a lot of work to do or in many cases, it simply means that nobody turned up to write those standards. So as of the 12th of April, there are now 100 standards on the official journal, including some of the most common ones, 300 to 328 for Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, etc., 300, 220, and 330. So that covers all short-range devices from 9 kilohertz all the way up to 1 gigahertz. But there are some common ones that are not included. New standards are being added each month. For example, draft EN301893 version 2.1.0 is published, but not yet listed on the OJ. And we hope that version 2.1.1 will appear soon and then appear on the OJ. But uh, I suspect that will be after the 13th of June. Are the new red standards different to the old ones, old RNTTE ones? Well, yes, as I've just said, in most cases they are. Additional receiver tests have been added. Spectrum sharing requirements may be included. There are some standards where the receiver tests aren't changed. Um, there are some products uh, that I've issued type examination certificates for where the receiver testing before was equivalent to the receiver testing now. Uh, and, and so there are certainly cases where retesting or additional testing is not necessary. But in many, many cases, some additional receiver testing is necessary. Of course, there are some products 
platform. Broadcast uh, devices below nine kilohertz, for example, they've never required a receiver performance standard before because they were EMC devices until now. And then you also have some other types of products like GPS receivers or GNSS. Well, they were radio equipment devices under the RMTT directive, but they never had a product-specific standard before. People used to just use the short-range device standard 300-440 for GPS receivers, and now there's a, a dedicated standard written for that device. In addition to the red changes, some companies have taken this opportunity to get their own updates into the Etsy standards based on test, based on test methods or even new technology types. So at Etsy, they've seen changes to the standards. So they've seen people turn up to contribute and, and request changes to the standards which are not related to the RED. Um, perhaps changes in transmitter test methods. If a test lab wants a different test method introduced, or in the case of EN301893, for example, all those changes to adaptivity are simply because of future types of device that also want to use that frequency band. So they're not specifically changes related to the RED. Receiver performance was a non-mandatory quality issue in the past, but now it's part of the RED requirement and therefore it's unavoidable. So can a notified body help? Well, yes, uh, a notified body can issue a certificate to the RED based on test, testing or assessment. So if you have a standard which is in draft format, or maybe it's published, but it's not yet on the OJ, or let's say you have some testing from your old RNTTE um, test report, and you've got some partial testing from the new standard, and it's not quite a full cover of the new standard, but a justification can be made, well, then you could go to a notified body, and you may be able to work with them to get a certificate to the red. This is obviously very ex uh, extremely helpful right now. However, please note that a notified body can't overrule the new technical requirements. You couldn't, for example, go to a notified body and say, well, I've got my old RNTTE test report. There are new uh, test cases for the red in the new standard, but I don't really want to do them. So can you just issue a certificate for me? Of course, the answer would be no. It may be possible to do only partial testing. For example, if all those transmitter tests are the same, but only a few receiver tests have been added, then perhaps just testing those new receiver test cases may be okay. If you want to sign your DOC and proceed without a notified body, then you really need to go through that new standard in detail and check that you've covered every little change. But if you're using a notified body, then some of the cases where the test method or test procedure has changed, maybe the, test, the notified body will be uh, able to accept that. The radio test standard is not yet listed on the red OJ, a notified body must be used. You can't state compliance without a notified body if the st radio standard isn't on the official journal. You do not need a notified body for test reports to non-harmonized EMC and safety standards. I feel like I've mentioned that a few times now, but uh, it's a question I get asked many times. If you assess your product to a draft standard now and get a notified body certificate, it's important to keep your eye on the development of that standard because as the standard changes and develops, there might be uh, technical changes. It might just be admin. It might be that the standard gets voted and published and displayed and you might realize you don't need to do any new testing. You can just update the standard number on your DOC. But if you're testing to a draft standard, do keep your eye on the development uh, and do keep close to Etsy just in case the test cases change. So all this talk of radio standards, does it mean no changes at all for EMC and safety? Well, not quite. The essential requirements may not have changed so significantly for EMC and safety, but there are still changes which do affect them. For safety, for example, uh, the scope of the directive clarifies that you need to think about animals and protection of property, but also you need to stop and have a little think about the reasonably foreseen use of your product. Maybe your product has some kind of feature that you know people are using it that way, and maybe you've just tried not to think about it too much in the past. Um, but uh, it's time to stop and think, okay, well, that is how people are using my product. For EMC, there's a change in the state of the art. It's not a change in the standards as such, but it's led to a change in the standards. For example, EMC, EMC RF radiated immunity. 
previously, you would have tested from 80 megahertz up to 1 gigahertz, and then again from 1.4 to 2.7 gigahertz. Whereas now the test cases go all the way from 80 megahertz to 6 gigahertz without the big gap, and the exclusion bands are smaller. Uh, one thing to be warned of as well, some of the EMC standards such as EN 301489-3, short range device one, the performance criteria has changed a bit. So you might have a device which passed in the past, uh, maybe the way it performed, the errors that it had um, under your original R and TT testing would be considered a pass. But now, without any change to the product or without even any change to the testing, it would fail to comply with the new RED because the performance criteria and the pass-fail criteria has changed. Where are those EMC and safety standards? Well, certainly they're not actually listed on the red OJ yet. Hopefully that's not a big problem for you. Um, just continue to use the standards that are most appropriate for the device. For example, all of those EN 301 489 standards, they're all out there, they're published. You can get them off the Etsy website. Some of them are still draft, um, but uh, they're not actually on the red OJ yet, but they're still the ones to use. And the same with other EMC standards. So for example, if you have a, an IT product which contains a radio, and so maybe you're also testing to EN 55032, for example. Well, just because that standard's not listed on the red OJ, it's still the correct standard to use for your product. Similarly, if you have a washing machine or a refrigerator, a good place to look would be to go to the EMC directive and low voltage directive official journal and you probably find some good useful standards on there to use. Just use the standards that are correct for you and remember that you do not need a mandatory use of a notified body uh, based on that. Uh, one thing, yeah, quick comment there. Of course, using a, a standard from another directive or a, a, a non typical standard doesn't actually provide presumption of conformity, which means in your technical documentation you would you would keep some explanation of exactly why you chose that standard. But if your justification is, well, it's an IT device and I used the IT standard, or it's a household product and I used the household product standard, well, that's a pretty simple justification to have to write. There is a red guide in development. Uh, I think the last time I gave a uh, uh, webinar on the red. It was a very immature document, and now it's much more mature. It's a very good document. Uh, a draft uh, Word version was issued on the 25th of March, or at least made available on the 25th of March. You can't do a search on that document yet. It's not published, um, but it looks good, um, and uh, they're hoping to issue it. The EU Commission is hoping to publish it within the next month or so. I have a horrible feeling they might actually be waiting for input from me uh, before they can proceed, but it will be here soon. It does not, of course, change anything about the directive, but it does help to provide good guidance. Okay, so uh, the red guide itself uh, covers some general issues. Um, if you, uh, as I mentioned before, you do want to do a search on the EU blue guide, that's where you'll find most of the issues with regard to things like CE marking and um, placing on the market. The red guide only really covers radio specific items. Now, as a manufacturer, you need to then keep your technical documentation. Under the RNTT directive, it was called the TCF or technical construction file. Now it's called the tech technical documentation. I'll go through some of the key documents here. Firstly, the technical documentation, just like the DOC, must be kept by the manufacturer for 10 years after placing the product on the market. Now, if your first question there is, does he mean the beginning of when you place it on the market or when you place the last one on the market, then if you have to ask that question, it means you're still not thinking about the fact that it applies to each individual unit, not the whole product range. So your declaration of conformity and your technical documentation applies to each individual product that you're placing on the market. So of course, by default, you could say, therefore, it's going to be the last one that you place on the market. 
You must be able to show your technical documentation to any market surveillance authority if they ask for it. And of course, it's also the information you'd send to a notify body if you want to get a certificate. Typical contents will be very similar to the sort of things you might send for an SEC application or to an old RNTTE notified body opinion. Block diagrams, schematics, parts lists, technical data sheets, operation descriptions, test reports for safety, EMC and radio, user manual, installation instructions. If it's a class two device, such as it has restrictions, then there'd be some markings on the packaging and you'd need to include that, external and internal photos. A copy of the Declaration of Conformity, the notified body certificate, if such a thing exists for your product, an explanation or a statement that the product can be used in at least one EU member state must be within your technical documentation, and an explanation regarding any restrictions of use. So if it's a class two device with restrictions of use, uh, then you'd need to explain what the restriction is. For example, five gigahertz Wi-Fi indoor use only. And if there are no restrictions at all, then that also must be explained and detailed in your technical documentation. And finally, there must be a manufacturer's risk assessment. I'll come on to that in a, in a few slides. So let's look at some of those documents which have uh, the most questions. Test reports. Well, I apologize to any of the labs on this call, but you do not need to use an accredited test lab for EU testing. Well, of course, that's actually good news for the test labs because how can you get a draft varying uh, non-published standard onto your accreditation schedule? Well, you can't. So when the standards are published and harmonized, probably it's going to be very easy to get that onto your accreditation schedule. But um, that doesn't really matter too much. You do not need to have accreditation for EU testing. Testing can be done by the manufacturer or an independent test lab, whether they're accredited or not. The manufacturer must have confidence in the the testing, of course, and they, when they sign their DOC based on those test results, so that's probably why people will continue to use accredited test labs. And of course, you must test or assess to the latest RAID requirements. So this risk assessment document, it's not like a, a standard safety risk assessment. That, that probably would have been dealt with by the, uh, the safety testing. This is more of an opportunity for the manufacturer to step back at the final stage and look at their whole compliance approach and consider if they if they missed anything. Maybe that they've applied a safety standard, but, but if they stop and think about it, there could be more than one safety standard that applies, or the same with EMC. Maybe the device has features or functions or modes or accessories that they didn't include in the testing, and now they need to go back and check that. Maybe the product has advanced features which are not yet covered by the published standards. You know, for the FCC, if you have a product and you test the FCC rules, and it passes, then that's it, you get certification. But for, for the EU, if you test the standards, but you know your product could cause some problem in other ways, well, you're responsible for fixing that because you're signing a declaration to the directive, not to the standard. The label, well, the labels or markings on the product, the product must still be CE marked. The notified body number is not used for the red. So if you've been using a notified body under the RMTT directive, and you've had their notified body number on the label, it's time to take that notified body number off when you transition to the red. Unless, of course, you use the full quality assurance route, but that is very rare and very expensive. Uh, the alert symbol, uh, which was used under the uh, RNTT directive for class two devices, is not used under the red. That's the exclamation mark in the circle. So you would take that off. Contact details of the manufacturer, the name and address that must appear on the product, as I said, if the product is too small, the address of the manufacturer can't go in the user manual. And of course, the product must be identified, such as with the manufacturer's name, model name, and then also if it's something like a batch number or a serial number or a date reference or something to trace it. The user manual. Under the red, the CE mark does not need to be in the user manual. It did under the RNTTE, but it doesn't under the red. Here's a new thing. The technical data of the product must be in the user manual. You must state the frequency range of the product and also the rated output power of the transmitter. Accessories or other influencing factors must be listed in the user manual. For example, if your product comes with a detachable antenna 
or even with an antenna port with no antenna you provide, you're going to have to list what uh, antenna is permitted in the user manual. Software, uh, for example, if the user could change the software and if that software could affect compliance or performance, then that needs to be listed in the user manual. You need to make it clear to the user which software versions they're allowed to use and which accessories they're allowed to use. User, user manual must contain any kind of safety instructions for compliance, anything that's going to uh, ensure that the product stays safe. Also, any information about restrictions of use for class two devices, such as what the restriction is, where the restriction exists. There is a draft document which shows a, a pretty little picture of a book with an explanation mark in it and a table of countries. And that's the latest guidance on how to label um, the restriction on the user manual and on the packaging. And so we would always recommend you follow the latest guidance. Declaration of conformity. Well, all applicable directives appear on one DOC. It might mean it has more than one page, but uh, it's still going to be just one document with one signature. It was created by the manufacturer, and if the product is rebranded, then the new branded manufacturer takes, uh, creates their own DOC. And the DOC must be made available um, for that product for 10 years. So, for example, if you update your product line and you've got your DOC online, because remember, on the user manual, you could provide a, uh, a sort of short link, a declaration statement with a web link to the full DOC. Well, if you update the DOC, then the old original DOC needs to remain available for 10 years in case somebody finds one of your older products. It must contain all information of traceability, such as the manufacturer's name and address, must reference the notified body if you used one, and the product itself, including those hardware accessories like uh, hardware versions, accessories like antenna types, etc., software versions if that affects compliance. They're all listed on the DOC. DOC should always list the standards you used and uh, have a signature. The DOC must accompany each radio product. You can provide a simplified DOC statement in the language of the countries where you're selling it, um, and that can accompany the product with a web link to the full DOC. Okay, so uh, I think we're a few minutes from the end, and only, I think, I've written seven weeks left to go, but I think looking at my calendar, it's six weeks and six days left to go. Um, so hopefully uh, everybody is quite comfortable with it now, but I suspect we might still have questions, so I'll... Uh, I'll look to Steve to see if we have any questions. Well, Michael, uh, thank you. We did receive a few questions, but one of them you just answered regarding um, since the red includes EMC and safety, does the DOC have to have a separate line for each of those declarations with its standard or just simply say red on a single line? Yeah, so um, if, you, uh, if you have a product, then the EMC directives and the safety directives are not going to apply. Um, the red applies. So you would state that um, the product complies with the red. And then underneath, you would explain the standards that you used. You would list, for example, we use these safety standards uh, for Article 3.1a of the directive, uh, these EMC standards for Article 3.1b of the directive, and then these radio standards for Article 3.2. So if we look closely, at this, uh, I have received the same question here. So since EMC and safety have been covered under red, for the, direct, for the declaration, do you still need to list EMC, safety, and red separately? No, well, you would, you would declare to the red, but then you would list EMC, safety, and radio within uh, on the declaration of conformity. And it's exactly the same as it was under the RNTT directive. So under the RNTT directive, you would have declared compliance to the RNTT directive. And then on the full declaration document, you would have listed which safety, EMC, and radio standards you used. OK. And Michael, we, we also received under the Q&A tab a question. And, and I'd like for you to go ahead and read that yourself okay. and answer. Sure. Let me see what I can do here. I believe you can. I mean, I can read it, but I think you'll get Yeah, no, I'm just reading it now. So um, we believe that the manufacturer email address and website is not required 
He cited Article 2, but 3, I notified on Ah, yeah, so I think Peter is correct. Um, the, uh, the original text said that the, uh, there must be some way of contacting the manufacturer, uh, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be an email address uh, and website link. So, uh, yeah, I guess that would be perhaps confusing on, on my slides. Uh, there needs to be a way of contacting the manufacturer, uh, and probably the best way is the, the written name and address of that company. So, no, it does not need to be the email address and website. So, um, so that's correct, but it doesn't need to be that. Well, very good. I have a question sure. from me. I, I, I just 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 seen one more question on the Q and A. It says, must the manufacturer include batch number or serial number on the DOC? Uh, with yes, because um, I mean, I guess if if you've got one product and one DOC, and it's really clear you've got one model number, then really you've you've covered it. You don't need to list the actual serial number on the DOC. Um, and you don't need to list the actual batch number of each product on the DOC. If you did that, let's say you manufactured 100 products a day, then you'd end up creating 100 different DOCs each day. Um, and then each different serial number model would have its own unique DOC. That isn't necessary. Um, let's say you've got a model out there and you put it on the market and it's model XYZ and then you've got the DOC to match it and that's perfectly fine. The only time you need to think about this though is if let's say you start selling that in August and you're selling them for three or four months and let's say the standard changes or your product changes. Let's say the standard. So you've still got model XYZ and you're still selling that but you're changing your DOC because the standard has changed. So let's say on a particular date in <coughs> December, or let's say the 1st of January 2018, you issue a new DOC for the new products that are coming out. Well, then you've got two DOCs on your website. You've got the one that covered the models you placed on the market from August until the end of December, and then you've got the second DOC uh, from the 1st of January onwards. So anybody looking online at your DOCs is going to need to know which DOC applies to which one. So at that point, you might start saying, right, this first DOC applies to batch numbers 1 to 10 or, or serial numbers 0001 to 0100 or something, and then this other DOC applies to serial number 2000 onwards or something. So you do not need to list the batch number um, or serial number of every little product on every uh, DOC, but you do somehow need to make sure that you are um, tracking it so if somebody has a product, they can see which DOC applies. Great Hopefully answer. That makes some sense. Yes, <laughs> it gave a good explanation. I have a question for me. If uh, faced with a non-harmonized standard, should a notified body be contacted prior to testing, and what information of the notified body should be requested to establish a test program and a follow-on is the use of a notified body during the test program, can that same notified body be the approving authority without a conflict of interest? Hmm. Well, I would say that in most cases, um, the standards are pretty self-explanatory. So um, they're not too complicated. In the olden days, in the early R and TTE days, you had a standard which included um, essential test cases and conformance test cases. So often you would have, let's say, I don't know, 20 test cases, um, but only maybe 10 of them were essential. Uh, and that's where the old um, identification of essential test suites uh, idea came from. Whereas nowadays, those ETSI standards, uh, they, um, they, they include just only the testing you have to do and, and not anything else. Uh, and so if you're faced with a non-harmonized standard, you should be able to test to that non-harmonized standard without contacting a notified body beforehand. Uh, there shouldn't really be much question. Maybe you would. Maybe you would go to a notified body and say, hey, look, I plan to use this non-harmonized standard. Do you think that's a good idea? And they would say, yep, sure, go for it. Um, but it, it isn't the case that you have to have some kind of uh, consultancy, if I can dare to use the word, uh, with a notified body prior to testing. Now, 
if the notified body has somehow provided some sort of engineering consultancy to develop your product, then you, you know you should not really be using that notified body. They, they should not be reviewing the product. But if you've simply said to a notified body, which standard should I use? Is it this draft one? And, and that notified body has said, yep, you've got the right one. That's the draft one to use. Um, then that, that's the notified body just helping point you to the correct standard, I think. And, and so it should be no problem for that same notified body to, to do the review because they've not really uh, been involved in the testing or development of that product. Hopefully that makes Very sense. Very good. Very good. If a uh, test program is in process and a new revision of the standard becomes harmonized, does the test program have to update to the newer revision? Yeah, so that's that's interesting. It, anytime you place a product on the market, you've always got to be thinking of the latest requirements. Now, once once we get into it, once the standards are all harmonized and everybody's happy, um, if a new standard comes out, we'll typically get like an 18 month or, uh, or so transition period. Um, and, uh, and so that'll be fine. But right now we're in a complicated situation and hopefully it's a bit of a one off uh, whereby the standards are changing, the, the draft standards are changing. Now, if you have a product type uh, where the draft standards are changing quite significantly, like tests being put in or removed, then I would really recommend getting quite close to Etsy, joining Etsy, in fact, and um, keeping an update on the development. So if you're testing to one draft standard, you can already see what's being added or removed. Um, but if you're not an Etsy member, then at the very least, keep up to date with the standards. Because, yeah, if you're testing to a draft version of a standard and then a new version comes out whilst you're testing and it's got an additional test case in it, then you know you're in the lab. You should get in there and, and carry on doing that testing. It's not like certification where you say, "Oh, I did it on this date," because the reality is, if you do that testing and then you put it out and you sell the product, well, straight away you're going to have to go back and retest anyway. So, uh, if you're midway through your testing, then there's there's no better time, <laughs> I would say. Very good. Well, I think that's covered the questions. I don't see any more came okay. in. I, th um, I think there's, there's one more on okay. um, on the Q&A. Let me just see Go if ahead. I can. Yep. Um, uh, there's two, in fact. One of them has put, um, how about software versions? If we update the software, do we need to update the DOC? Well, the software version only needs to be on the DOC if the software version could change the compliance of the product and the user or installer has an option to change the software. So if the software version makes no difference to compliance, then you don't need to list it. Or if the software version could change compliance, but the user or installer has no access to it, let's say, for example, uh, you do an over-the-air software update of your own product, but that the, uh, the user or installer has no way of knowing or changing or stopping you, uh, then you don't need to list the software. It's really a case of for cases where the user or installer could change the software and the software could affect compliance, and therefore you somehow need to inform them of, of which software is allowed to be used. Okay, okay. and then one more, uh, one yep. more question. If a, cert a certified Bluetooth module manufactured by company X is added to a C-marked piece of laboratory equipment manufactured by company Y, what testing is necessary on the final product and what marking, etc., need to be placed on company wise product? This is a good question and it's an interesting one on a few levels. So, firstly, I'll pick up on the first text of the question which says, if a certified Bluetooth module. So, firstly, there's no certification uh, in radio equipment directive nor in the RNTT directive. It's all declaration of conformity by the manufacturer on the end product. Um, and so what you're really talking about here is a Bluetooth module which has a CE mark by the manufacturer of that module as a radio product. Now, if they have somehow assessed that Bluetooth module for use inside that exact piece of equipment that you've installed it into, then the module has been approved or tested, if you like, for use inside that piece of equipment and all the testing should have dealt with that 
and so there should really be no additional testing mandatory. But let's assume that wasn't the case. Let's assume we've got a typical module manufacturer and they've just tested their Bluetooth module. If we look at the three aspects, we've got safety, EMC, and radio performance. Safety, of course, is always going to be done on the end product. You can really just write off the uh, safety assessment of the module. Let's just check in that the module itself is safe. When you install it in the end product, of course, the end product is going to get a full safety assessment. Then you've got EMC of the radio link, which will have been done on the radio module. Now, company Y, in this instance, making the laboratory equipment, they'll do their EMC testing of the lab equipment to whatever EMC test, uh, test standard applies. But they will also be responsible for the EMC performance of the radio link. Because all those EMC tests, radiated immunity, et etc., they're going to not from the module to the end product. They're going to be completely, uh, you know, there's no, no way to compare the two. So all of the EMC is, is needed to be done by company Y. And that's, you're probably going to end up with kind of a Venn diagram between the, uh, the radio performance EMC standard and the, whatever the host product's EMC standard is. And um, but, uh, make sure you don't have too much overlap, but at the same time, make sure you cover everything. And the, uh, but that just leaves radio, and this is the slightly more complicated one. Why is fully responsible, uh, the installer? But do they really want to go back and test all those things? You know, if we look at Bluetooth, the conducted antenna out, uh, antenna port output power, the bandwidth of the signal, the rate of hopping, uh, the average time of channel occupancy, the number of channels, none of those things will change. Just adding it to this lab equipment is not going to change any of those things. So company Y, if they can see that it's got a C mark and hopefully maybe they have the test report or a notified body certificate on the module, then they, uh, they're they not going to decide to test all that. The most common uh, guidance is that they should test or retest the transmitter radiated spurious emissions on the final product of the Bluetooth operation. Now, of course, if the module is RED compliant, then that's probably it. If the module is RNTTE compliant and the final piece of lab equipment is uh, being sold under the RED, then obviously those additional receiver performance tests are going to need to be done, either by the module manufacturer or by the lab equipment manufacturer company Y. And then finally, um, company Y is the one who issues a declaration of conformity um, for the whole product. You know, effectively, when you install a module, you're ripping up the CE mark on that module. There's no, there's no kind of contains uh, FCC ID equivalent type thing. You're installing it. Uh, and it's a good reminder of the, the old quote, CE plus CE does not equal CE. So you've installed the module, you've tested safety and EMC, you've tested some, any missing radio emissions, for example, but some radio test cases you've decided to trust. Um, and uh, then you are fully responsible for that end product, which contains a radio. So your end lab equipment user manual will contain the rated output power and frequency of your Bluetooth. Your, um, your name and address will be on the, uh, the product and on the user manual. And your declaration of conformity will be to the red and you'll list the EMC and safety standards you used, and you'll list the radio performance standard you used or the module manufacturer used. Okay, uh, hopefully that's quite clear. Um, Michael, sorry, that was quite a long answer. <laughs> that was excellent explanation, however. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the depth you went there, and, and I'm sure right. the person asking the question did too. There was also a question regarding risk analysis. Um, sure. The content of the risk, uh, let's see if I can find the question. Could you provide additional uh, information on the risk assessment? Yeah, sure. I mean, like, uh, the way I relate it to people, it's like, um, you know, it's, you don't want to get caught up in this full-on safety risk assessment. That That's part of your safety testing. I always like to say it's a little bit like you're leaving the house and you think, now, did I, did I switch the oven off? Did I turn the lights off? Or did I feed the cat? 
you know, if, if you're just checking, did I do everything I was meant to do? Um, and when I've asked people at the European Commission or Etsy or ADCO uh, for sort of examples, some of the common examples they give would be, well, let's say you've done safety testing. It's a, a Wi-Fi access point. So you've done safety testing to EN 609.50. But then you've made it weatherproof and it's outdoors. So did you remember to do also EN 609.50-22 for an outdoors radio? And did you think about that? Um, or let's say you've got a device um, and uh, it could be used powered by the battery or by an AC supply, say a phone or something. But then actually, you also know you're going to have it powered by a 12 volt DC car supply. So, did you assess that? Um, you know, let's say you make a module and you're just selling it to anybody openly and even automotive manufacturers. Well, um, it could be in a car in Finland in winter, minus 40 degrees, or it could be in a, a car in Italy or Greece in summer, you know, plus 50 or 80 degrees. Um, and uh, also, it's a very interesting thing for module manufacturers because uh, if it gets installed into a vehicle or a fixed installation, then it, the module remains the uh, end product. So, you know, that could be uh, that could be a concern for them. Or any kind of, uh, you know, did I uh, did I really check that? Uh, anybody puts a, a lesser quality cable on than I did or you know did I really cover every little test case so a lot of people have been asked like the the RED compliance association were asked to create a draft risk assessment and they said we can't every product is different so it's impossible um, and uh, so I think it's just kind of a I've seen typically they're about one page long <laughs> okay I said okay and had my microphone muted. Thanks. Oh. <laughs> uh, we're gonna we're gonna let the uh, the questions end at this point. You've uh, been with us for a while. I said we've not lost any attendees. However, they've been most interested in your comments, and I personally feel it's an education every time I listen to you discuss this. Uh, this That's has been really. a very uh, an excellent presentation. I recommend it for everyone. I do want to uh, go over a couple of small items regarding the academy, so bear with me for just a second. And uh, I, I've got a few things. Uh, next week in this wireless technology series, we're going to be talking about the anatomy of a test presented by John Rapella at Washington Laboratories. Uh, we also have some product safety things going on, discussing general product safety. I think the May 2nd is the third one of the six-part series. Uh, Mill Center 461 is available. Mill 810 is going to be coming up. And just so everybody is aware, the safety uh, EMC Society Internet, the safety product uh, evaluation symposiums in May in San Jose. Uh, we look forward to being there if, uh, if you have attendance. And the uh, EMC Society SIP 2017 Symposium, the week of August 7th in Washington, D.C. Our CEO is the general chair for that program, so we're heavily sponsored and heavily involved there. Look forward to seeing everyone attend. Uh, unless I see, Mike, did you see any other questions come in? Well, I don't see uh, any. So nothing, nothing else for me, and uh, I think okay. I, I, I I shall jump off the call. Thank you very okay. much, Steve. Thank you. This concludes our webinar. I thank everyone for attending, and the entire team would like to thank you all for being here, and Michael, particularly you, for your excellent presentation. I will now close the meeting.